Hey, Sammy here. I'm not your typical job counselor. I work remote and I travel the world as I kickstart careers. This is raw, real, and on the road. Hi, I'm Sammy and this is the Career Kickstart Show. I am so excited to be bringing you Sarah Nada, who is a speaker and also, curiously enough, she is a very happy and cheerful lawyer. And I thought that <laughs> <laughs> because you don't always hear that, you know, um, so many lawyers can be kind of like jaded and cynical. And I know that there's people who want to be lawyers and like it's just uh, a unique perspective on this career path. Um, and I thought it'd be just really interesting to have you on. Now, you know, Sarah, can you let us know what your elevator pitch is and just share that with us? Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Sammy. Um, basically, yeah, I'm, I'm a very happy lawyer and I haven't always been that happy uh, as in my career. I've always been a happy person, but for Sometimes there was a bit of a dichotomy uh, in the way I was in my high heels as a corporate finance lawyer and I developed that happiness. I developed my, my joy both at work in the office and outside the office through yoga, meditation, body work. Um, training is a forest yoga teacher, training is a body worker, uh, speaking and um, speaking to people about what passionates me, um, what passionates me, sorry that's French, <laughs> I, 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 what I am passionate about, yes I, I, um, I work in, in a multilingual environment and sometimes Fringlish comes out of my mouth and but basically yeah, I, I just want to reach out to every you know, lawyer that is unhappy right now in their career or every, every person who wants to become a lawyer and is wondering whether it's the right career for them because they hear about all those unhappy lawyers out there and to share my message of hope that it is possible to be a happy lawyer. Oh, well, I love that, Sarah. Thank you. And... You know, how about we start from the beginning and you can talk about how your career has evolved so the people listening can get um, an understanding of the evolution of Serenata. Yes, I didn't really want to be a lawyer to start with. I, I just wanted to bugger off to London and needed a very serious uh, degree to convince my parents to let me go. <laughs> so law was a serious enough degree for, for my parents who who um who are doctors. And so here I was, I arrived from from the north of France, uh where I did my high school. I originally I am originally from Northern Africa and I was brought up there, did my high school in France, wanted to study abroad, arrived in London and I was lucky enough to really enjoy studying law and to really enjoy being in London. I didn't really know whether I wanted to pursue a career in law, but I just went along and I did the first undergraduate degree and a second undergraduate degree and a first postgraduate degree all that in law. <laughs> and after a while, my parents kind of reminded me of the fact that I needed to start working at some point. So I did. I worked um, in a bank because I heard from a lot of um, a lot of lawyers working in law firms, as I am working now. Uh, that um, yeah, that that it's just a really that's just a bit of a drag. That the hours are long. That you work really hard. The money is not you know that good in comparison. And really, in house was was um, the place to be. So I started my career in-house doing my civil service. Uh, that's an option the French government offers. Instead of doing a military service, you can do civil service in a French company anywhere in the world. And I was hoping to go somewhere exotic and I ended up in Luxembourg in a bank. 
Uh, oh, how exotic. <laughs> <laughs> it was very exotic, right? Uh, and it was Luxembourg about 10 years ago, which, um, you know, which is a very different place than the Luxembourg I am in now. After a few months, the credit crunch hit and I, I finished my contract and left left Luxembourg and started a career in academia. I went back to, the, to my beloved King's College London where I studied uh, my first undergraduate degree and um, I taught there for, for a few years. So my academic uh, career was fairly short, a few years, uh, two, three years. Very um, fulfilling in the sense that I really loved teaching and I hope um, my students enjoyed, enjoyed my teaching, but I found research pretty lonely. I'm, I'm a fairly chatty person <laughs> and at university you don't really get to exchange um, so much with your colleagues because everyone is so focused and specialized in their own fields and, and you don't really have office hours and yeah so I qualified in, in, in the UK, I started my qualification in the UK and then arrived back in Luxembourg where I knew with my language skills and my previous experience I could I could um, kickstart a, a new a new career in, in corporate in corporate and then in, I went on to do more finance law and the few years the few first years were, were pretty exciting because I was learning a lot uh, but very quickly the long hours the billable long hours the all-nighters the stress the tight deadlines caught up with me and I found myself dreading to go back to work in the morning and and I was just always wondering you know why 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 that was because that's the career I chose and one forced me to do it I enjoyed my working environment my colleagues you know I loved my colleagues and I could not put my finger on what was wrong despite the lack of sleep uh, you know I, I could I could I could see that you know, I needed to sleep a bit more but but that could not justify how miserable I felt at the time oh did you um, feel like you were like in a rut or something like that a, a bit you know in a rut I also felt like I let myself down I let my I felt like I let my 18 year old self down in the hopes and aspirations that I had and to cut a long story short, I, I've reached rock, I reached rock bottom uh, when I ended up in intensive care, uh, pretty sick. Uh, after a, a long haul flight um, at the beginning of my annual leave about a year ago, I was diagnosed with pulmonary embolism. Totally, totally. Uh, you know, totally by, by chance in a way. Uh, I, I, was not, I was not feeling particularly unwell. And that was, that was my wake up call. That really was it. And I was sat on my intensive care bed in Austin, Texas, thinking, all right, Sarah, it's about time that you decide to get a grip and just embrace your joyful side every day of your life because you're spending so much time at work that you cannot be miserable most of your awake time. And yeah, so that's that's what that's what happened. I I one day that's that that that's so yeah that that time in intensive care when I arrived uh then and I was given that diagnosis is the day I made the decision to stop listening to 
everyone around me telling me that it was normal to be a miserable lawyer because that's what serious people serious people have to be miserable <laughs> in a way that you cannot be taken seriously if you're not a miserable person austere and you know not laughing and wearing collars that just doesn't go with the image everyone wants um the, the image of the lawyer everyone wants to hire and i found out that day that it was just not me and I now found out that it was not true, that actually being a joyful lawyer makes me a more successful lawyer than being a miserable lawyer. You know, it's interesting that you say that because that is something that I've noticed um, in a number of different fields where it's almost like if you're like the happy person or if like you're just not a stick in the mud, people are almost like mm. suspicious, like, why, why are you happy here? Why is there, there's no place for happiness in this office. Um, yeah, especially as a woman. Let's yeah. face it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, just, you know, being a smiley, discreet woman is more acceptable than being a, 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 a joyful, out there woman. I'm not saying girl, I'm saying woman. Just earning mm -hmm. up your femininity, joyfulness, and also how awesome you are and how much ass you're kicking at work. Mm-hmm. Preach, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah, I love that evolution. And I feel like that is definitely something, you know, that a lot of um, my listeners can kind of resonate with you know, is that understanding of, you know, whatever the moment, and we all have that one moment where we're like, you know what, life is, life is too short for this BS, you know, it's time to figure out what I can do to up my joy um, quota, you know, and to, you know, kind of take that level to, you know, bring that joy to my, to our lives. And I really like that you are, you know, kind of claiming the fact that you can be happy, you can be a woman, you can be a very serious and professional, professional woman type lady, you know, and not have, you know, people be suspicious because that's the thing. People get burned out. I've actually known lawyers who just burnt themselves out and you can't do that. You actually have to, to stay productive as a professional, to stay in a career path you have to be able to find the joy. And just speaking of that, where do you think um, in your search for upping your joy, what was what would be like a really good first step for people to just like add a little bit more joy to their own careers? Oof, um, I don't know about people in general, <laughs> but for me, what really worked was first to reconnect with who I really was deep down. And I had a friend of mine, actually, who's also a coach, help me do that. Um, her name is Rosie, Rosie Volcano. And she got me first to ask a few people what I meant to them and and I did that because I think deep down I could not really see who I was anymore I was so lost and my friends my family my ex-boyfriend <laughs> they they spotted what I had lost, they spotted my joyfulness, they spotted you know, what made me me. And realizing that, having that, hearing it, reading it, seeing it in the videos, the audios, the letters they wrote to me, was, you know, it was almost like a light, light, lighthouse to me. And like, okay, this is where you're going. This is who you really are. This is the person you forgot to be for a very long time or you have been trying to deny 
visibility. You've you've tried to to shut her down for so long, um, but your closest and dearest, they're not mistaken. They have they have seen you. They've heard you. They've felt you for so many years. They know who you are, who you've been, and who you have become. And yeah, that was my first step. My second step was to shut down my ne- my own negative chatter, my my jabberwocky, you know, in up in my head, the <laughs> one that the one that always tells me that I'm not good enough, that I am not, I could do so much better that. In every single circumstance, I'm either too much or not enough. That I could do more, that I could be more. Um, and I was like, you know what? Just, just, you know, close your mouth for at least a few seconds or a few minutes a day. Give me a break. I gave me a break through meditation. And then brought that break into my non-meditation life. So, you know, quieting my mind during meditation and trying to quiet that negative chatter during my awake awake time. And yoga, reconnecting with the body, I felt let me down. I felt that my body was such a let down because at 33, I was pretty unwell and doctors didn't really know what was wrong with me. And all that together made me slowly, made me slowly start dating me again, if this makes sense. Like getting to know me again and getting to love me again, little by little. And then getting to discover what I really love doing, like like painting and and drawing, which is something I never thought I would do or enjoy doing because I was like, well, I can't really draw. My drawings are not that nice. I didn't really, I, even as a child, I didn't really enjoy drawing because I was so self-conscious that my drawings were pretty basic. <laughs> 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 I kind of like over myself for so long about stuff that I love doing. I yeah, I, I I love doing that, although I was not good at it. But who cares? My my spirit, my soul sparkles sparkles up when I do that. So I'll yeah, I'll just do it. You know. <laughs> I love that. You know, and you know, and I can completely understand, especially about trolling. I I enjoy it very much. Um, but I have that jabberwocky, my own jabberwocky that I'm trying to silence when I do it. Um, you know, and thank you for sharing, you know, these tips in your journey. Because usually I ask people, what is the greatest gift that anyone has given you in your career? But it sounds like you gave yourself the greatest gift just by getting back to you. Yeah. Uh, I took responsibility for my own bullshit. That's for sure. <laughs> love that. <laughs> You need to like be res- because it's so easy to blame everyone else. So easy to blame your parents, your family, your friends, your boyfriend, your job. So easy, but at the end of the day, we need to take responsibility for what happens to us as well. So I did give myself that present. But I must say that I wouldn't have been able to, you know, I I wouldn't have had the courage, the stamina to do it over so many months because, you know, we're talking about months and months of recovery and work and work that's still going on. If it wasn't for my family, my parents, my siblings, my friends here in Luxembourg and abroad, who have been a very important support system for me, my tribe, my forest yoga tribe, but also my colleagues and my partners at the firm here. And 
because you don't often hear that. And I want to publicly acknowledge that my partners and my firm have been there for me, my colleagues as well. They've taken on my workload when I was sick. They have been supportive when I was in hospital, outside of, you know, out of hospital, back in the office. They've helped me re, get reacquainted um, with work slowly um, but steadily. When I needed um, time off, like in September, I took um, a month off. Although I was not in hospital, I was, you know, I'm, I'm still undergoing procedures, etc. But it was really a month for me to reconnect with me. And yeah, they, they've nicely accepted to give me that time, that time off. And I would forever be grateful to them for, you know, and, 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 um, yeah, I, I definitely want to acknowledge and and thank them and and spread that message as well to various firms and companies who are wondering how to retain people because they did that for me, but they also send a strong message within the firm that it's not because you could have a bit of a blip in your life that you've worked for the firm for a few years that the firm's going to ditch you uh, if you want your associates to stay by your side whatever the economic um, the economic situation is uh, or or their personal situation is then it's a give and take especially for people of our generation I think who are a bit more yeah, a bit more used to leaving um, employers, uh, you know, a bit more than our parents' generation. It's uh, it's a give and take, and I think here at the firm, everyone appreciates that. Yeah, and that's actually quite unusual. A lot of people that I talk to have you know, the opposite sort of thing where they don't feel that kind of loyalty. Um, and companies who can do that, they really create a sense of psychological safety. So people yeah. actually want to stay. That's the yeah. thing. By working mm. with you, they were able to keep your institutional knowledge at the firm, which, you know, maybe I'm on a soapbox here, which is going to be something that a lot of companies are going to realize that they are going to need because mm. you can't just keep, you know, kind of almost chasing people away and expect to have everything run smoothly. Um, but Sarah, thank you. You know, and I think that's going to be something that for a lot of folks who are interested in law can be something that will really make them feel good to know. Um, and just to switch gears before we um, kind of wrap up the interview, I would love to ask you, because I usually ask all my um Yes, who are sharing their career story. What do you think was one of your biggest career mistakes? And, you know, and just shed a little bit of light because I feel like we can always learn something from a good mm. mistake. <laughs> yeah. Um, my biggest career mistakes all stemmed from not talking, not speaking up because I always thought that you know, getting your, keeping your head down, having a stiff upper lip, just getting on with it and keeping everything inside was the way forward. And that, you know, people would, people around you would understand and your boss would understand what you really want. You don't need to, you know, speak about it you, you and definitely should not ask because nice girls don't ask they don't ask for a raise they don't ask for time off they do not ask for a secondment you know that's not what you know nice girls do they just get on with it do the work close deals and if you are liked enough or if you your your work is recognized 
um, then you'll be given what you, you, you are asking on the inside and no one else knows about it besides you. And to me, that's just, that was, that was the biggest mistake I've done. And that drove me to resigning from previous jobs where I probably should have been a bit more assertive and vocal to start with rather than just becoming, yeah, becoming, uh, yeah, disillusioned and yeah. resentful. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely the advice I would give anyone out there and the advice I would have given my 23-year-old self back in the day. Yes, I I can agree with that very strongly. That's one of the things that I actually work with a lot of my clients about is that they, you know, they feel like if they speak up, you know, that they, you know, they feel this lack of control and things like that. But one of one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of companies, especially startups, is that yeah, you know, some people just have terrible managers, but other times like the managers want to know. They they want to mm. know where the company's mm. at. They want to know where their mm. employees at. Um, and if they don't get, you know, that understanding of like, okay, are you happy? What's going on? They can't really help you. Um, no, so that's so. such a good point. Um, now, Sarah, you have been a fantastic guest, and <laughs> I <you. laughs> I've enjoyed this. I think that this is a really cool perspective on a career path that, you know, I was like, you know, let's, we've all heard the lawyer jokes, you know, and you've probably heard more than your fair share. Of, yeah. <laughs> you know, so a really good perspective. Now, Sarah, I also know, you know, you're a speaker, you're a joyful lawyer. Now, where can people find you online? Um, just kind of let us know what you're up to. So people can find me on LinkedIn. It's Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, hyphen, Nada, N-A-D-A, Arthur, A-R-F, like Frederick, A. I also work at SIBA in Luxembourg, that's C-I-B-E-E. -E. We are a, a Benelux international firm specializing in corporate finance and tax. And yeah, if you, if you also want to connect with me via Facebook, <laughs> please look me up and, you know, uh, just, just give me a reason to add you in my friends list. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. G give me a good reason. I feel like I should, I should put that on my um, profile because every once in a while I get some random person and I'm just like, who, who are you? Are you lost on the internet? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much again, sir. I do appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who is listening. I'm Sammy Gardner, and this is the Career Kickstart Show. Bye. Bye. Find something cool at cool.careerkickstartacademy.com.